My guest is Roger Savory. Roger is an ecologist focused on turning deserts into grasslands. He's director of Savory Holistics, which utilizes livestock to reverse desertification, restore water cycles, and help eliminate harmful agrochemicals from our food, water, and air. Roger, how are you today? Um, hot, I'm good. Even when I'm bad, I'm good. Thanks for asking. Yeah, glad to hear it. Uh, thank you for uh, returning for a second visit. In your 30-year career in holistic land management, have you seen some remarkable ecological transformations? And can you describe some of what you've seen? Uh, Hart, absolutely. Uh, it's, I think it's the only thing that's kept me going for 30 years. Uh, the excitement of seeing a desert turn back into a grassland, the excitement of seeing a river that hasn't flowed perennially for 50 years to start flowing again perennially, the excitement of seeing water, um, a, 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 a rainstorm and water all go into the ground and no runoff at all. And then three days later, the, the, lo the local stream uh, rise up and start to flow again. Um, all of these kind of things just are, are kind of what have kept me involved because the way my mind works, I like to see progress. I like to see things going in the right direction. And, uh, and I think all humans are like that. Um, we get encouraged by success. Um, so yes, I've, I've seen amazing things, but I think Clearly, the, the thing that really registers in your mind is when you see a river that didn't flow for your entire lifetime and your father's lifetime start flowing again. That, that's what really gets you excited and going, we've got to replicate this and do it on a larger scale. Right. That, that sounds relevant to many of the problems we're having ecologically in the U.S. today. Tell us about your current proposals. What are you trying to accomplish now? <clears throat> Hart, what I'm trying to do now, um, uh, you know, I kind of jokingly say I'm trying to do the impossible. Um, and the only reason I say that is um, the historical record over the last 4,000 years that we've got a written record and 10,000 years that we have a record shows that no matter where in the world we try to halt and reverse desertification and deserts, we as humans have been unable to. Um, and uh, so uh, everyone likes a challenge in life. But I picked the hardest thing I could possibly think of and said, well, if no one's been able to do this in 10 or 4,000 years, pick your number. That sounds like a challenge I want to get involved with. Um, so we've picked a area alongside the, the shores of the Salton Sea in the Imperial Valley in California as the first project site. Now, there are numerous other sites we could have chosen but we were looking for the worst of the worst. Um, and that's got, that area has got an air, a rainfall of only two to three inches of rain, if any rain falls at all. Um, it's a quote unquote, a rain shadow effect area. It's not actually a real one. It's a man created one. Um, it's got, it's an area that since the 1950s, the US government has been pouring money into trying to solve the problem of the Salton Sea drying up with nothing but failures. So, you know, when, when you've had uh, 70 years of failure, you kind of lose hope that there's any chance of doing something differently. Um, so, so we've chosen that area because um, it is the worst of the worst, but it has the potential to do incredible good. Um, it's, uh, it's part of a vital um, air stream flow that creates droughts or, um, or good rainfall for the entire Midwest of America. Um, you know, water coming up from Baja, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a vital area. It's uh, one of two key target points on the whole planet. Uh, it's kind of, it's called a watershed uh, point where if we can make an impact and make a difference here, it will have far reaching positive impacts. Um, so yeah, pick the worst of the worst and the potential to do the most good. And yeah, that's, that's, I, I'm little Johnny in the back of the classroom saying, pick me, pick me. I, yeah, I pick me. <laughs> so this sounds like a dumb question, but is your proposal climate smart? I mean, when I think of climate, it's not just about temperature. It's also about, you know, rainfall, et cetera. But is your proposal climate smart? 
does your proposal help eliminate greenhouse gases for one thing and generally heal the climate? So it's, it's, it's not, a, a, I wouldn't even say it's climate smart. It's beyond climate smart. It's, it's, it's vital for humanity that we do it. I, I mean, yeah, we can talk about greenhouse gases. Yes, will it solve all those problems? We can talk about uh, carbon sequestration in the soil. Well, that's another word for, for saying creating fertile soils from current blowing Absolutely. sands. We can talk about the heating and cooling of the atmosphere. Yes, it'll cool the atmosphere so we don't have the extremes of temperature. Mm -hmm. We can talk about hot winds blowing into Los Angeles and San Diego and, and melting the, uh, the, the ice cap. Yes, it'll, it'll, it'll work on that. Now, obviously not initially, but when we get up to a large enough scale that, that we're um, having, having these, the scalable impacts. Um, and, uh, and more importantly, it'll, it'll actually feed humanity. So at a time when we've just crossed the 8 billion human mark, you know, and we're all worried about you know, how we produce enough food, you know, if we can get the idea into, into humanity's brain that these were the highly productive regions of the world, these were the bread baskets. Humans turn bread baskets into deserts. Okay, let's turn deserts back into bread baskets. The, you know, the, these pieces of land, they've only changed and the weather patterns have only changed and the climate has only changed because of what decisions man made. Well, okay, we're the same men. Let's now make new decisions based on new data, based on new learning to in fact reverse the damage our ancestors did. And when I say our ancestors, I'm going back, you know, some of the records I'm reading are 38,000 years ago. That's so long ago, none of us can even consider it. But it was humans who created the change that caused the, you know, caused the, uh, the micro water cycles to stop functioning. Well, we now know the root cause of it, so we can now reverse it. So yes, I would say beyond climate change, um, but categorically, everything that people are talking about socially and politically right now, it solves all of those problems, yes. So one tool in the toolbox <laughs> is the grazing of livestock. And people don't know that livestock can benefit the land. How does that work? Because we're taught that livestock is bad for the land, bad for the climate, cow burps, uh, methane, they used, they drink too darn much water, but what do most people not know that might change their minds about the role of livestock? Well, you know, I'm not even going to get excited about livestock. We have to use them and they are a tool. Mm -hmm. In my mind, they're a tool. I, I'm fundamentally a, a wildlife person. Um, so I would much prefer to see the American bison back, back on the range. But I will tell you one thing. If you walk out to some bison, they're going to flatten you. They're going to steamroll you. People don't like bison horns um, you know, in their kidneys and livers. However, uh, cows are generally much more gentle and much more easy to work with. So the cows are a tool. And while we take the next 100 to 200 years to build bison herds back up, you know, the, the, the cow, the sheep, the goat, they're not the enemy. They're just a tool based on how we utilize them. Now, uh, an interesting uh, survey was done at White Oaks Pasture. Now, it's not, a, uh, it's not that brittle an environment. It's kind of a higher rainfall area in Georgia. But what the auditors audited a feedlot, and then the exact same auditors audited White Oaks Pastures. Um, which is owned by Will Harris and his family in, in um, Georgia. And the figure that came out of White Oaks was that healthily managed pastures using holistic management um, sequestered, uh, well, um, well, I'm trying to think of the right way to say it, but basically the percent was 111% improvement over you know, the feedlots, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, not only did they draw in more carbon than they sequestered, but it was by you know, an astronomical number. And the good thing was that it was the exact same auditors who did both. So the auditors who said feedlots are bad and CAFOs are bad, 
are the same auditors who said, hey, but this pasture management is good. Um, so it's it, the tool, don't blame the tool, blame how we use it. Um, there is nothing about a CAFO harvesting a monoculture of corn to feed cattle or, a, or genetically modified soybeans to feed cattle. Um, there is nothing about it I like in any way, shape or form. The feed we feed the cattle is full of toxins and poisons and chemicals. The way they live is uh, antisocial. It's, it's not nice. The dust, the everything about it is awful. Now, but we currently do it. We have feedlots with over 500,000 cattle in there. Now, if we just repurpose those tools, which are the cattle, and use the exact same tool, we can use it for good. Um, a very simple and horrible analogy is if I use a hammer to smash in your skull, it's a really bad tool. Ooh, hammers are bad. If I use a hammer to pound in nails to build you a house to keep you warm and dry, it's a really good tool. Don't blame the tool. Blame what we use the tool for. Um, so, uh, you know, cattle are a fantastic tool and the only tool we currently have available for fixing climate change, for sequestering carbon, for feeding humanity, but we've got to get them out of the fixed um, CAFO confined animal feeding operations into confined animal portable feeding operations to move them across the desert continuously so that the byproduct that they leave behind is a byproduct for good and a byproduct to regenerate our ecosystems. So when I, when I study old historical documents, you can see how livestock were good, livestock became bad, and we've been grappling with the how and the why. Well, we finally figured out the how and the why, so it's time to, I think after 4,000 years, it's time for us to try something new. Right. So uh, how does the operation work? You're proposing a cattle ranch to the east of Los Angeles and San Diego in the Salton Sea Valley. So how does the operation work? The, the cattle, uh, let me let, leave that open. I have a more specific question. Like one thing that's confusing at first is that the cattle are roaming across a certain stretch of desert that does not have grass for them to eat, but you're growing the forage elsewhere and then bringing that in. But then after a while, the cattle have the an impact to turn it into a grasslands, right? Yeah, so it's, it's you know, it, I have to try and put everything to a city analogy so people from cities understand it. Um, but the best way of describing it is when we build a new subdivision, we have the bulldozers come in and we tear up all the soil and, uh, and they, they make a form and they pour a concrete slab and then they, you know, in a week, a whole new house goes up. When the whole new house is up, no one wants to move into the subdivision until they've brought sod and rolled it out. And now there's a lovely sod green lawn. We're doing the equivalent in the desert, except our bulldozer is the cattle herd. And the sod is the forage that we grow in another area, just like the sod farms are in agricultural areas. We grow sod in agricultural areas. We slice it up and we move it to the city suburb and we unroll it. Our version of that, because we need more complex life to get uh, the entire ecosystem functioning, our version of that is we grow 120 different uh, varieties of forage all together so that where we're growing the forage, we're not raping it and leaving it bare. In other words, we don't want to create, we don't want to solve one problem and create another. Now, a, currently a sod farm, it pulls up all that soft, uh, topsoil and moves it to the city. Well, now they're creating a desert where there was you know, roots and everything. Um, so they create one negative to create one positive. We've rethought it and said, okay, how can we have positives in both locations? So by having our 120 species of forage, um, we can... Um, we can build the soil life up in the fields where we're growing the forage 
and then we can move that soil life um, over to where the cattle are being fed. And uh, by moving the soil life over to where the cattle are being uh, fed in the form of these 120 species, then we feed the cattle in the desert um, just on rubber mats and stuff. Um, so they eat this forage that was cut a few hours ago, transported on average for the Salton Sea, our average transport time from field to cattle will be 30 minutes. Now, in an ideal world, hopefully Elon Musk will have his, uh, his autonomous electric trucks that can bring, bring it from the field straight to the cattle. But it's, we've got to grow it in one location where there's irrigation, move it the 30 minute drive to the desert, have the animals in the desert eating it. And then um, as they move forward across the desert, what they leave behind is what we call the biological carpet. And that is the medium that protects the soil microorganisms from harmful ultraviolet light and maintains moisture so that life can begin to grow again. So I imagine that mix of 120 plant species is superior in many ways to what cattle eat in conventional operations, uh, nutritionally for the cattle, nutritionally for the food that the cattle become. And so, but can you say more about that? Well, categorically. So, I mean, if you look at uh, any of the movies on transgenics and the harm of growing corn and soy using genetically modified plants and the roundup that's used on them and the abortions and the birth defects um, for any of those animals, when, uh, when uh, GMO corn or soy is fed to pigs that have to give birth, they give birth to deformed animals, they have diarrhea problems, they have all sorts of horrible problems. As soon as farmers have stopped using GMO corn and soy, they have found all the problems disappeared. So we know that this big agricultural Monsanto derived method of agriculture is having seen and unseen significantly negative consequences. Um, by planting 120 species together, what we're doing is we're getting a balance of the legumes that fix nitrogen, so we don't need a nitrogen fertilizer. We're getting the sugar, um, the sugary plants. Uh, we're getting the protein plants. We're getting the grasses that uh, their leaves protect the soil. The grasses have a very high lignin content in their leaves, so that becomes their armor on top of the soil to prevent ultraviolet light. So we're getting this whole mix and it's a total natural mix that has been there for millions of years. For example, the Serengeti wildebeest, they graze on 140 species of grass alone in the high felt, high felt and they graze on a different, totally different 140 species on the low felt. Mm. And then both the high and the low felt have over 1000 legume species. So in natural systems where we haven't destroyed them through agriculture yet, we literally have thousands of species for grazing animals to feed on. Now, you know, um, the nutrient density of the food when an animal, every uh, kind of in my work, what I've seen is that every plant is, it has the highest nutrient value and nutrient density for about two weeks of the year. Now, if you have 120 species, it means that at any time of the year, something is at its peak. So at all times of the year, these animals are being fed with plants that are at their peak nutritional density. So the bone marrow gets peak nutrition the whole way through. The, the muscle gets peak nutrition the whole way through. The brain, everything in that animal gets peak nutrition and nutritionally dense nutrition the whole way through. Whereas the CAFOs are currently feeding uh, you know, two monocultures of corn that has no nutritional value. It's been bred out of it. And the other part of it is the soybeans that have no nutritional value. Um, and, and in fact, with their genetically, genetic modification, we know from the studies that they're actually doing a lot of harm but more importantly, all those poisons that are being sprayed on the fields are killing soil. They, 
They're, they're causing cancer. They're causing birth defects in the workers who work on the fields or who live nearby. I think the Salton uh, Sea area has a 30% asthma rate among the children, uh, in particularly the native tribe there. So, I mean, 30% asthma is not normal. You know, and I believe it's all these decisions we've been making. So part of our plan is to grow nutritionally dense forage without chemicals to then feed to these animals so that while we finish them and get them ready for the market, they're grass finished on the most you know, nutritionally uh, dense forage we can feed them so that we create a product that's a much higher quality than, than what's currently being done. Now, will it be as... <clears throat> excuse me, will it be as profitable as the guy with the feedlot with 500,000 cattle? Probably not. But is there enough room that it can be done and pay for itself without the obscene, and I am saying obscene profits that people, yeah, like the big three, JBS and, uh, and Cargill, the profits that they're making in the current meat industry? Yes. Is there any need for people to obtain obscene profits at the expense of human health? No, there isn't. We can do things better. And, and that's this, the goal of this project is to try and do everything better. Let's talk about uh, drought and restoring land so that it does not suffer from drought like it does now. The American West is experiencing the worst drought in 1,200 years. How can your proposal help restore water cycles, bring more rain, and make the ground into more of a sponge that soaks up the rain when it does fall? So that's a loaded question, but there's so many parts to it. Um, okay, so the first thing is there's the macro and the micro water cycle. Uh, the macro water cycle, I, everyone understands the water comes up off the ocean, blows over the land and falls. Well, let's talk first about the macro water cycle. It's currently not functioning. And it's not functioning because the water that's sucked off the Baja, the sea in Baja, comes north up the Imperial Valley uh, and before it goes east um, on the backside of the Sierras and heads to the whole Midwest of America. So it gets sucked up, fine. Then it comes over the Imperial Valley and it's so hot it evaporates and it gets pushed back to the, to, the, uh, to the Baja. Well, if it gets pushed back, it doesn't get to blow in land. And that's why we have the worst drought in 1200 years. Things will only get worse. We really have to do this project so we can cool the temperatures between the irrigated land and the irrigated land for that big stretch along the Salton Sea. Because that big stretch is currently what I believe is causing the droughts in the Midwest. So we kind of almost have to cool those temperatures so that we cool it so that the hot air doesn't bluster up and blow the ocean uh, evaporation back to the ocean. It must be allowed to re-establish its part that it's had for millions of years. It must be allowed to come back up the Imperial Valley and then turn uh, turn east and blow in. Now, so that's the first thing on the macro water cycle. Now on the micro water cycle, we can't fix a macro water cycle until we fix the micro water cycle. So the micro water cycle is more important. The biological carpet by default um, is this layer between the sand and the atmosphere. And it's this layer that protects the sand from heating up from the heat from the sun. And it also uh, is an ultraviolet light barrier. But the best way to describe it is you, you are lucky, you've got nice long hair. If you look, I'm kind of bald. So if I, it, the, this experiment doesn't apply to me because I'm the desert. But if I shower and just with this little bit of hair on the side and this bald, and I then I shower, I get my hair wet, and I put a shower cap on my head. Probably in five days time, my hair will still be damp. Now, if you shower and you get your head wet and you put a shower cap on, I'm guessing 10 or 20 days later, your hair would still be wet 
probably mm -hmm. be growing mold and everything. <laughs> well, that's what the biological carpet is. It's the shower cap. Mm -hmm. It holds the moisture in so it can't evaporate and blow off and dry. So the wind currently dries the soil. The sun currently dries the, the sand. But if the wind can't get to the sand, and if the sun can't get to the sand, because there's an inch biological carpet, that is the shower cap that will prevent the evaporation. Well, now we've begun to fix the micro water cycle. If we can hold the, the moisture in the soil, then the fungi can start benefiting from it. When the fungi benefit from it, then they can trade water with the plants for sugars. Well, now the, the plants start photosynthesizing. Well, when they're photosynthesizing, they uh, evapotranspirate more moisture. And so we begin to get this micro water cycle functioning where you have dew not coming from the atmosphere, but coming from the soil overnight, where you have all these different things begin to happen, but it's all based on a living system. So once we fix the micro water cycle, then I believe we will, by default, fix the macro water cycle. And I actually think we'll reduce the, we will reduce the severity and the frequency of both droughts and floods. It's counterintuitive, but it makes sense when you think about it. Why do droughts and floods tend to go hand in hand? Oh, that's, that's very uh, simple. So the drought causes the bare soil. The drought causes the capping. The drought causes everything to be bare, hard, and compacted. Then the first rain comes. It cannot get into the soil. So it has no option but to flash flood off. Now, I'm using the word soil, but it's the incorrect word because it's not the soil. Soil is a living organism. It's actually the chemical sand. So in the drought, the sand becomes exposed. The sand gets hot and baked and caked and, and the, 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 the small particles fill in in between the larger particles and it creates this capping. And so water cannot penetrate it. And then as soon as the, the first rains come, they compact it worse. And then the bigger, heavier rains come and it just, it, it flash floods off. The data is really interesting. Bare soil has 84% evaporation of precipitation. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's, you know, you know for every 10 inches of rainfall, eight, straight back up. And uh, bare soil has 84% uh, evaporation and 10% flash floods off the land. Okay. Now covered soils only have 10% evaporation. So for every 10 inches, nine inches stays in the soil. And then they also have 10% flow off but it's not flash flood off. Mm -hmm. It's gently flows off the land, clear, crystal clear streams, et cetera, et cetera. So a bare sand um, creates, you know, has an 84% loss immediately. And a covered soil only has a 10% loss. And that difference, that 70% difference between the evaporation rate and the non evaporation rate uh, between covered and bare soils, that 70% is what is required to feed the aquifers. So at the beginning of today's interview, you asked me about what I've seen, and I've said a river start flowing again after 50 years, because just in just six years, we were able to get so much additional water to go into the soil that we filled up the aquifer again, and the river was able to start flowing again. That's amazing. So what's the status of the American West today as, as you see it? We, you, you're bringing a proposal that solves the problem of not only drought, but desertification, but how would you describe the American West to somebody who 
doesn't know anything about it. So for the what we call the flyover Americans, the ones who fly from New York to LA and back to New York, they've looked out the window. They've seen from about Texas on, it's nothing but sand. I, there's only one way I could describe it. It's in deep, deep trouble. And, and only going to get worse. Uh, it's been getting worse. The worseness is accelerating. If we plot it on a curve, it's now going vertical. Yeah, it's, uh, we, we, the, the, you know, people, NASA has looked at the Sahara Desert and seen that, you know, 10,000 years ago, there was a village every 20 kilometers across the whole Sahara. And today they're like, how is that possible? It's all desert sand. Um, just go and look at Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Texas, Utah. You'll understand, California, you'll understand. We've done the same thing. We had the first early warning with the Great Depression's Dust Bowl. Then we created the Soil Conservation Service to improve it. But last year we had the dust storms come back again. So we reacted and then we got blase and uh, things are in really bad, bad condition everywhere. So we're proposing to solve this problem in no small measure with grazing animals and, and through a business model which, where the cash product is grass-fed meat. Does grass-fed meat cost more? And if so, what kinds of consumers are willing to pay more? So um, first, let me correct you. I'm going to say grass-finished meat. Okay, yeah, good. Um, and uh, so every cow grows up on grass and the Big corporations have tried to greenwash the term and steal it mm -hmm. from the small farmers. So they're like, oh, well, our animals are grass fed and then finished on like corn. Like which ones aren't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and then finished on corn. Um, and, uh, and look, I've been around a long time. I've yet to see a cow with a beak. Um, so when I see a cow with a beak, I'll start feeding them corn until such time. They're going to get legumes, they're going to get broadleafs, and they're going to get a little bit of grass. But uh, if you look at what they evolved to eat, they evolved to eat legumes, broadleafs, and a bit of grass. So, uh, so that 120 forage mix uh, is designed for that. Now, by finishing them on forage, because um, we can't really call it grass fed, because only 30% of the whole mix is grass. So it'll be, you know, they'll be forage finished. Um, and technically, we sell that it for more than the feedlot meat currently for one reason, because we can. And there's the old rule of business, you know, what's something worth? Well, it's worth what someone's willing to pay for it. So the grass finished meat industry currently sells their meat for more because they are the rare commodity. So they can ask more for it. As soon as we're doing, you know, a couple of million animals a year, um, finishing like this, well, we might find that we no longer have the um, supply and demand um, uh, dominance. So in which case the price will come come down. But bottom line, the cost of producing an animal in America versus what it sells for, there is no comparison. So if we wanted to, we could undercut the feedlot animals. But you know, people who invest in the project will want their, you know, to see their investment going well. We'll need to make a profit so that we can uh, do more desert, uh, you know, expand the project. Um, so we'll charge as much as the market will allow us to charge. But uh, you know, one of our first markets is, uh, is, the, is the Los Angeles school districts who want grass finished animals uh, and local. Currently they get their meat from Tasmania. So if we can, if we can uh, um, produce into the local market um, and, uh, and out compete the Tasmanians, lower our price and out compete the feedlots, we'll do what we need to do but there's so much of a difference between 
the, the profit margins that JBS and, and Cargill are making are so astronomical that can we reduce our price? Yes. But let's let the market and the free market decide that. But I will say that the entire meat commodity market in America hasn't given an honest price to the farmer since the 1950s. So the entire meat um, market is a fake market to subsidize cheap meat into the cities and supply cheap meat into the cities. Um, can we compete with uh, our project meat? Yes. Do we intend to? Yes. <laughs> So what grows in the desert after the cows move through? So you're bringing in the forage that's been grown elsewhere. You put the forage on the ground, the cows move through and eat the forage. And so what, what grows there afterwards? Is it seeds and spores that blow in or is it seeds uh, from the forage mix that you feed the cattle or is it both? It's both and a third option. So- What's the third option? So, uh, in one, two, three locations around the world that we've done this uh, pro project on a small scale, new species that were unknown to us have reappeared. As in the seeds that are viable in that sand from a thousand years ago, when they get the right conditions to germinate and grow, might, I say might, germinate and grow again. But we have seen it in Africa, we've seen it in Canada, and we've seen it in Australia. So I'm presuming the same thing will happen uh, in the Salton Sea. So that's the third option. So we will choose seed varieties that we think will do well in the desert environment to add to the feed. Um, and the current desert varieties that are there will obviously go woo, -woo party time and they will do well. Um, and then I think the third option will be what I call evolutionary seeds that were there you know, thousands of years ago that will germinate and, and grow again. And, and we have seen scientists have got seeds that are 2,600 years old that they found in caves in New Mexico. 2,600 year old seeds were put in a Petri just dish and germinated. Um, so, uh, so yes, so I think there'll be a lot of confusion and a lot of excitement. A lot of people are, oh, it's not native. No, we only have one planet. The native, non-native uh, argument is a, it's an academic argument. It's not mm -hmm. based in, in biological sciences. It's not based in succession mm -hmm. um, and it's not time-based. Um, you know, uh, native at what point in history? Mm -hmm. Remember Gondwana land was one land mass. So everything was on one land mass mm -hmm. and the continent split apart. How far back do you want to go? But anything growing in the desert and supporting life is better than blowing sand not supporting life absolutely absolutely so in nature birds follow cattle so you have this the cattle following a path where you're leading them and they're eating the forage and then birds come along behind that uh, and you're in, going to introduce chickens uh, so what role do chickens play in the operation and what role do chickens play in ecological restoration? So um, all of the wild places that we've done this in, we've had the blackbirds or the cattle egrets or whatever come in to help. So we do expect to see a lot of wild birds uh, start following the herd, et cetera, et cetera. However, um, we've generally found that there are not enough wild birds for the kind of numbers we're talking about. Um, and, and what we found is that by having chickens with the herd, if there's a tick in the cow's ear, the chicken will come and find the tick. Now you see in Africa, we have tick birds. We don't have those here, they've gone. They used to be here, they're gone. Um, and they're gone because the bison that they lived on were exterminated. Um, so, yeah, so we've got to try and replicate what used to happen. And the chicken are a useful tool. Now, they won't be the chickens that can't walk. These will be egg laying chickens. They'll be real tough barnyard types, um, heritage chickens, um, you know, um, and they, the flock will just stay with the herd 
and their job will be to scratch the dung paddies to look for fly maggots. By them cleaning up the fly maggots, we lower the, the burden of flies on the cattle. Mm. Um, and then also, sometimes a cow paddy can be eight or nine inches high. Well, we know from any gardener will tell you, if you put four inches of mulch, it stops uh, any weeds growing. So we know that. Mm. So if we've got a nine inch high cow paddy, well, that would be an area that wouldn't grow any desert plants. Mm -hmm. So what we need is the chicken to come and scratch it mm -hmm. back down to the one inch that we need. Right. So, so they are kind of like continuous land management. You know, they, they're, the, they're the, the garden trial, just preparing the bed. Mm. Now, the side effect is that they will give us lovely, organic, healthy eggs. Um, and, uh, uh, you yeah, so they're performing three services. They're cleaning the animals, they're cleaning the animal dung, and they're uh, doing soil preparation. So we need them for that in the project. Um, and the byproduct is you know, every two years, the chickens will be available as shoe chickens, but for the year and a half that they're producing eggs, um, we'll probably get an egg a day out of them. Um, and there's, there's nothing more healthy than a good uh, farm-raised chicken egg. Absolutely. So the cattle operation that you're proposing will have the or the effect of restoring land ecologically over time. And land that is ecologically restored, no doubt, has higher value for multiple different purposes and uses. So is the increase in land value part of the business model? Yes, it is. Um, if, if you look at uh, our figures over a 20 year period, the land increase in value is worth about 10 billion and the meat sales over that same 20 year period is about 11 billion. So the land model is almost half, half of the, um, actually it's not almost half, um, it, it's a significant portion. I, I can't say almost half because the one bit that I haven't extrapolated out is if the carbon marks markets stay stable using the current prices, um, the payment for carbon sequestered, the carbon markets are talking about a hundred years worth of payment. So we only did the figures to the 20 year mark, but the carbon figures um, should continue on for a hundred years. And if I take a $300 million carbon payment, per year and multiplied by 100, it dwarfs both the land value and the, uh, and the meat value. However, we would also have more land being turned uh, into desert and we would have more meat being produced. Um, so, but the bottom line is it doesn't really matter. It's, it's a profitable business. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and this is kind of standard in the industry, so we're not reinventing anything, but you can kind of expect a 20% return annually. Um, and that's just because that's the current meat market. Um, but the, the value of the land, that's what I'm excited about because uh, we can uncrowd. You know, uh, deserts are actually nicer places to live. Um, you know, they're warm, they're not cold, uh, but, but a, a, a grassland ecosystem is even nicer um, when you don't have the droughts, you don't have the flooding and, and you start managing the ecosystem. So uh, I, I know uh, in our model, what we, we're, we're talking about is once we've healed the land, then we'll have HOAs so that the land in perpetuity has a breeding cattle herd that then maintains the grassland so that it doesn't turn back to desert because this is what people fail to understand. Deserts are created by removing animals. So if we fix it and then say, oh, we fixed it, get the cows out, it'll turn back to desert in a few years. Once we fixed it, then we've got to maintain it with a breeding herd, but that breeding herd will benefit the local people. It'll create employment. It'll create males that can go into other, uh, other um, desert um, regenerative projects. Um, and to be quite honest, people like having cows around. They're, they're soothing. They're, they're, uh, 
they've been part of our culture for you know for a million years and uh, and we enjoy them right so so you're creating a nicer place to live a place that might uh, lend itself to hunting certainly better farmland a, a place where the uh, the ground soaks up rainwater and um, many many benefits but you have to understand the, uh, the you have to understand the value of animals and the role of animals in order to maintain it right yes yeah in the brittle environments now in the non-brittle environments where you have atmospheric moisture or rainfall year round the the animal that cycles carbon is called an insect in the brittle environments where you have a dry season and a wet season the animal that cycles carbon is a ruminant um, so yeah we can't have functioning ecosystems without ruminants in the brittle mm -hmm. environments a couple more questions how can your uh, how can this type of operation this type of cattle operation increase the nutritional value of people's food well Firstly, because the nutritional value of the forage that goes into the animals is so much higher. You know, instead of an you know, instead of two plants, soy and corn, they're getting 120. Um, they're getting plants grown in soils rich in fungi. Now, fungi are the chelators that turn um, chemicals in the soil that are not plant soluble and cannot be absorbed by plants fungi are what make it available to plants so uh, fungi kind of they, they they're kind of not nice guys they they hold these elements in the soils ransom and they say to the plant hey if you give me some sugar because mm -hmm. i need energy mm -hmm. to grow i'll give you this boron or i'll give you this calcium or i'll give you this you know whatever the chemical is um so they trade the elements with the plants for sugars. Now, that is the part of the, you know, of, of, you know, that is what we need for nutritionally dense food. We have to have plants that are healthy, animals that are healthy, and fungus and fungi in our soils. Um, and, uh, you know, most commercial agriculture, they spray, spray fungicides to kill all the fungi, they spray insecticides to kill all the insecticides. And they spray herbicides, Roundup, to kill all you know all the competition. No, those weeds are not competition; they're companions. So we don't look at it as competition and kill, kill, kill. We look at it as companionship and abundance and benefit life, benefit life, benefit life. But if you do that from where you grow the forage to then that forage with so much thought in put into it goes into these animals. And these animals get the benefit of this forage that was grown, you know, with an abundance mentality. Um, and then, you know, uh, they get slaughtered in such a way that, you know, it's as quiet and, uh, and, uh, and peaceful as possible. Uh, and then, you know, only an hour away over the mountain, they're delivered to the market. So you've got a short chain of production from, you know, the Imperial Valley right over the mountain into L.A., that's our goal with all these desert projects is to have them near mega cities. So there is a short chain of production so that everything is local. Um, and that's how we'll get the nutrient dense uh, food. But can you imagine those chicken eggs, how good they're gonna be? Yeah. When you were describing the fungicides and the herbicides and insecticides, I felt like interrupting and saying, if people only knew, you know, if people only knew what that does to our health, if people only knew what that does to the ecological health and ecological health flows into human health if we let it. So uh, my last question is, how can your brand of cattle ranching decrease the risk of disease from agricultural chemicals? Well, how can just quite simply because they are <laughs> not welcome. They are not yeah. welcome. Um, now, look, you know, in the big scheme of things, we'll be a 1% of American agriculture. So we're not even worth considering. But for, you know, I can't help feel that all humans, even the executives of Monsanto, 
even though they're making huge money and huge profits, I can't help feel that even they want their children eating healthy organic food. I don't think they want their children poisoned. I don't think the, the leader of Monsanto wants his daughter to give birth to, you know, to a malformed child. So this is a human thing. We all want the best for each other. Um, but you've got this, um, this mentality of chase money versus chase good. Um, and so the first thing is, you know, there might be some situations where some chemicals are needed, but in 30 years, I've pretty much figured out, um, and working with others, we've pretty much figured out how to cut out all the chemicals. Um, there might be some scenarios where we're like desperate, yeah. but it would be a one-off thing. Um, right. but the major thing is with the livestock. Um, so we've learned how to be beat the pest life cycle. Um, and, and so like a, a worm, I've told you, we've got the chickens to eat the maggots. Um, by the animals moving, you know, forward every day or every week to new forage, nearly every tick requires um, seven to 10 days later, the babies hatch. Nearly every worm, seven to 10 days later, the babies hatch. Well, if we're gone after, you know, after five days and we never return there for a year or two, whatever parasite hatched, it, it died naturally. So for example, the giant blue tick, the giant blue tick, that big old sucker that you sometimes see, that guy, after 10 days after he falls to the ground has a hundred thousand nymphs. So one tick becomes a hundred thousand, <laughs> but they can live off plant sap for up to six months. If they don't find blood uh, within six months, they die. Well, firstly, it, it'll be a desert. So there won't be any plant sap, mm -hmm. um, but let's say it rains right after these animals have been in this place and plants do start to grow. Yeah, there'll be plant sap. They can live for up to six months. But we don't plan on bringing animals back for a year or two. So anything that did hatch, uh, you know, the unlucky jackrabbit that comes through, man, he'll be covered. But uh, I'm sure, you know, the jackrabbits will learn to adapt and stay ahead. <laughs> um, but, but basically, we beat most of the parasites just by the fact that we we keep moving to fresh ground. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but individual animals, if there's an individual animal struggling, mm -hmm. we'll help the individual, right. but we won't do blanket treatment. Right. Um, uh, blanket treatment, we've just found never works. All it does is lower immunity. We want to keep immunities high and natural um, and, and plant immunity, animal human, immunity. So for example, the research is there that shows that uh, plants, 7% of plants put more sugar into them so that those plants are attacked by parasites. The figures from the 1930s and 1940s showed we lose 7% of our crops to pests. The recent figures with all the bombing and spraying and pesticides of everything show we still only use, lose 7% to pests. So why are we doing all the bombing? The plant has a natural mechanism to self-sacrifice 7% of the population so that those feed all the, the, you know, all the plants so that the other 93% you know, uh, uh, survives and thrives. So don't worry about it. You know, but, uh, but most of the stuff we'll be growing, um, our cycle will be too quick um, to worry about it. And that biodiversity, you know, when you've got the legume with flowers that's attracting the wasps and the bees and everything all mixing together, it's very hard for any one insect to gain dominance. Uh, because if an insect, for example, likes corn, well, there's a corn plant here and way over there is another mm -hmm. corn plant and way mm -hmm. over there. We're, we're not going to have corn and corn and corn and corn um, because we've got so many different species all growing together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, up the corn is a Dolichus lab lab is, is going up it and there's a this and that. So all the farmers who are currently growing this forage mix report that their, their fields buzz with the sound of insects. Mm. And, and that's the natural pesticide. The pest is the insect and the pesticide is the insect. 
There are, you know, attack beetles, assassin beetles, ladybirds. There are all these insects that prey on the other insects. So yeah, we're not going to worry about that. We're going to let nature have a, a normal, holistic, functioning whole process. Well, this is exciting. You know, you, you, this proposal and the methodology that you bring has so many benefits and so many exciting possibilities in terms of ecological health, human health, et cetera. Uh, Roger, how can people stay in touch with you and follow, follow you? So I would like it if people would go to our website, which is fixeddeserts.com. And there's a subscribe bar down at the bottom. And I, I'd like that just because then we can get your email address and et cetera, et cetera. And then we can send newsletters and, and keep people up to date and build the excitement. The second thing is anyone who has liked what uh, we've said today and is encouraged by this and sees a better future for their grandchildren, please, we have to have city support. So if you know 100 people or you know 10 people, please encourage them to watch these videos and to go on to fixeddeserts.com and subscribe. Um, so that's the number one place. And then if people are on Facebook and social media, we have a Instagram account, we have a Twitter account, and we have a um, Facebook uh, group. And so if they can go on to Fix Deserts on Facebook and, and, and join the group, but the important one is the website, fixeddeserts.com and subscribe. And then, um, uh, and then if people want to email me directly, you can normally do it through the subscribe bar. It'll go to info and uh, Sherry will intercept it and funnel stuff that needs to come to me to me. Sounds great. Roger, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Hart. Appreciate it.